Hello, and welcome, welcome to today's webinar hosted by Competitive Advantage um, on creating compelling content, some advice and some examples, which is being presented by Refresh, and uh, they're joined by one of their clients from Polypipe. Um, Competitive Advantage um, is a market research agency, and we also support strategy implementation, primarily for building product manufacturers, and we also specialize in specification sales. Um, this webinar is one of a series on specifier engagement, where we look at key elements of implementation with case study examples. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll take them at the end. If you could use the facility to the right to send through the questions and I'll um, put them through to the team, um, as I say, at the end of the presentation. We will also be sending you a link uh, to download the webinar so that you can refer back to it in the future. So for today's subject of com creating compelling content, I'm pleased to be joined by Laura Mashita and Lucy Moore of award-winning PR and communications agency Refresh. Refresh are Ma Manchester-based with extensive experience in the construction sector. Uh, and one of the awards they collected at last year's Construction Marketing Awards was Best Use of Content Marketing, which is why we've invited them to speak to us today. And joining them is Maria McDonald of Polypipe Building Products, whose uh, project it was that is being used as the example. Um, so let's get the, un the webinar underway. Over to you, Lucy. Fab, thanks for the intro, Chris. Hi, everyone. Good to be here today. So we're just going to start by covering off what you'll be learning on this web webinar. I think to start with, what good content looks like has changed massively over the past few years. We've been working on content campaigns for as long as we can remember. And kind of from our experience, a lot of brands have moved from predominantly content around uh, the written word to much more of a mi mixed bag nowadays, whether that's video content, social media, influencer-led content. Some are even going full circle and coming back to strong creative-led uh, direct marketing campaigns, uh, direct mailers, which if done correctly can be really, really effective. But with so many different channels and audiences to go at, it can be really difficult to decide what's right for you and your business. I think it can be very easy to get caught up in trends. But if your key audience, for example, isn't big on social media, there's not much point pinning your campaign content around it. So it's really, really important to uh, assess, assess strategically before you decide on the content that you want to put out there on behalf of your brand or business. So with that in mind, this webinar will very much start at the beginning, opening with how to successfully set your objectives and unpicking the audience for your content campaign and where they're digesting content and therefore where you should be seeding it out across. We'll then move on to looking at content channels, how we decide which channels and which formats to go for for our clients and then look at kind of coming up with the creative idea and the fun part before looking at content rollout, how to really integrate your content so it works on more than just one channel and measurement. And throughout it, we'll weave in a case study, uh, one that we're working on with Polly Pipe and Maria and the team at the moment, um, which is a video led uh, creative campaign called Question of Regs targeting uh, heating installers. So that's the format for the webinar today. I will hand over to Laura on our first step for creating compelling content. So before we go into the content, which is why you're all here, um, we just wanted to put in a word about objectives. As I think PR and marketers, we are very used to setting objectives. It's what we do at the start of every campaign and we do love running a good campaign. Uh, I think with a content campaign, it is absolutely critical to have your objectives because it is so easy when you're creating content to get distracted and go what down one path or another path and get a bit carried away. So setting your objectives up front means you can always manage yourself and pull yourself back to the real aims and what you need to do. It also means that if you're asked internally or externally why you did something, you've got that base of and, and you're the reminder to yourself as well as other people as to as to why you went with what you did. So I think always write down your objectives. If you can make them smart, um, make them smart. So specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and uh, to be delivered within a certain time frame. And if you can't make those objectives smart for any reason, because it's not always easy to then instead you can look at putting numbers on them and KPIs on them. So 
in terms of content that that could vary wildly depending on the type of content you're producing it could be anything from a number of downloads if you've got a piece of content on a website that you want to drive people to or it could be reach engagement for example if you're using social media so do that work up front it'll always help you police yourself and hopefully you'll see some examples of how we applied that within the polypipe content that Maria's going to talk about I think I hope <laughs> Yes, yeah, so it might be worth here, Maria, maybe just um, adding a line on what Polypipe's objectives were for this campaign, and then we can run through how we made sure we achieved them throughout the content that we created. Yeah, sure. So one of our main objectives for this was not only to educate installers on Part L, because we sort of, we understood that they were potentially aware of what was coming, but not necessarily aware of the ins and outs of it but not just present something that was a white paper or a blog post or, you know, just more reading for them. We wanted to give them something that was a little different as well. And also to position ourselves as a business that understood the ins and outs of these regulations and could help them comply in their day-to-day -day jobs, not just from a B2B um, perspective, which is what we normally um, market to, we normally market to businesses, not to end users. So that was really important to us as well. Fab, thanks Maria. So following objective setting, uh, uh, our step two around creating great content is looking at your audiences. Um, really, really important part to ensure what you're putting out there is going to resonate with your audiences. So for us, we always start at some um, persona profiling. So we knew for Polypi, we wanted to target predominantly uh, heating installers, um, so we looked at things like what are they doing on a day-to-day -day basis, where's the place of work, what general demographics do they fit into, where are they consuming the majority of the content and we have a really handy tool um, to start looking at channel analysis on the next slide as well. But we very much started with looking at the, the market and, and these heating installers and unpicking everything that they do every single day where they're consuming the information. We as an agency have worked with the installer market uh, for, for over a decade now. So for us with the Polypipe campaign, as Maria alluded to before, we knew that there was absolutely no point in creating long wordy content for heating installers that are essentially out in the vans for a lot of the day um, and usually consuming content on the go in between jobs. So the last thing they want to do over lunch is to sit down and read a 100 page uh, document on changes to part L of the building regulations. But equally, it's very, very important that they understand the changes, um, what they entail, uh, when they come in and, and how they can comply ultimately. Um, but we knew from knowing them, their demographics, what persona profiles they, they fit into, that long written content wasn't the way to go. So I'll hand over to Laura now for a bit more of an in-depth um, look at how we do kind of audience and, and channel analysis. With this slide. Yeah, this is it's a useful diagram really that you can use to start, um, I guess, honing your thoughts on it. So. Typically, you might have a few different audiences you want to target um, or a few different uh, sectors that you want to send a message out to. So you can really start separating those down. Um, so Lucy's talked about installers. So if I talk about specifiers, for example, um, you take the specifier audience, you look at their wants, their needs, their drivers. Um, what's going to make them look at content? What's going to turn them off? Um, any insights we can have a look at what are the competitors doing, the competitors to your brand, uh, what are the specifiers talking about? So really gathering all that intelligence. And then from that, taking a step back and looking at those conclusions, okay, how am I going to reach these people? Uh, where are the opportunities? Where are the opportunities that fit in with our skill set, within our budget? And you can really start then driving those channel plans, but being really specific with it as well. So you've not got much wastage. Um, you, you're really, really targeting those people who you want to listen and hear your message. Yeah, so off the back of that audience assessment and the channel analysis for Polypipe specifically, we decided to go with a social media first video led content campaign, um, which we will talk you through in more detail shortly with a core focus on disseminating the information across uh, core social media channels uh, which were TikTok, Instagram and Facebook. We knew these were the, the channels that heating installers are on on a regular basis. 
Um, so therefore the ones that would um, see our content the most. Um, we also did some bits online on a specialist content hub on the Polypipe website as well, which Maria will talk you through shortly. So your step four, when you've done your objective uh, setting, your channel analysis, you've looked at your audiences, is really the fun part. So the idea and the content, and it's actually this part that a lot of clients come to us for and use agencies for. Um, we're hearing more and more when we ask clients what they need from us as an agency, it's creativity and how to get something different that stands out from the crowd. So, of course, when, whenever you're looking to create your creative idea, it should always be based on and optimised for the audience and channels that you've considered key. So we knew it needed to be something that would work really, really well on social media. Um, so short form content, engaging, snappy, but also which would be educational because ultimately we knew we needed to educate heating installers on changes to Part L at the same time. I think, sorry to interrupt, I think tone of voice is really important here because a lot of the installers that we're talking to are one man bands, they're out on the road and they use social media almost like a second friend and um, so we're all sat in an office around kind of 20 other people who we can chat to day in day out they can't do that so to have content that actually talks to them in the tone of voice that they would use yeah. was really important as well which is why those social media platforms in particular were the ones that we could use because they're the ones where we can be a bit more uh, informal a yeah. bit colloquial yeah. and, and have a bit of banter ultimately which is what they want to see on their lunch hour yeah yeah, absolutely. And that's exactly where that we started when we uh, started with the idea sessions in the agency was that kind of tone of voice looking at the installers, what they'd really want to hear and ultimately what would make them laugh and share the content. So when we're coming up with creatives for content, we always start with a um, full agency idea session where we bring everyone regardless of whether they work on the account or not. No idea is too big or too small. Um, I think it's very, very important with creativity that people don't feel stifled. Um, even if there's certain ideas that don't necessarily fit, that don't always make the final cut, it really ha helps start um, create that creativity really and get people thinking a bit more outside of the box. We then go about refining it from there. So that's based on things like what's achievable through the channels that the client has available to them. Um, budget is obviously a consideration. Um, you can go huge or you can go small um, and, and still have great impacts with both, but that massively depends on budget for this. And ultimately, in short, it's about what's going to give us the most engagement with the audience. So for the Polypipe campaign specifically, we worked as a team to start the ideas flowing and then we partnered with um, our video, video agency, A Engines, to devise an idea which was ultimately fun, would educate installers but not be boring. So as I said before, updates to the building regs are traditionally sent out in 100 plus page documents. Um, we knew based on insights it wasn't appropriate. Um, so that's how we came to the conclusion of the campaign for Polypipe, which was um, a question of regs. So for those of you who haven't seen it, we're going to be sending around some links after this so you can see how the content rolled out. But we ended up coming up with a very much integrated digital campaign, which centred around a four episode video series with a cheeky twist on a classic TV game show. We called it a question of regs, question of building regulations. We thought it went really nicely. To do this, we worked with three heating installer influencers. Um, these do exist, very niche, but there's lots of um, plumbers, heating installers on social with great um, followings and great engagement rates. So we brought these three influencers um, along with some of the Polypipe team together into um, a boxing gym and put them head to head to challenge them on their understandings about Part L and the building regulations specifically. We had a really, really fun day filming all the content and we ended up cutting that into four episodes with each episode focused on one specific area of changes to Part L. We also then put those four episodes together into one big clip and hosted that on the um, Polypipe website on a landing page with lots of other different forms of content all around the regulations. Um, ultimately, we wanted to drive links to the website and the web page and Maria will talk a bit more through the integration in the in the slides that follow. 
And like I said, we'll also send links around so you can see exactly how this played out in practice. So I'll hand over to Maria to talk about how we rolled out the campaign for Polypipe. So I think when you're creating content, like you can sort of get a little bit uh, carried away with like the creative side of it, but that's only a really small percent. You need a really good structured plan to make sure that the results that you want from it ultimately come forward. So we worked with Refresh and um, with a colleague of mine, Alicia, who looks after our social media in-house to really put together a tight and structured integration plan and make sure that it was planned way ahead of time. And I think with this, um this piece in particular the grace period for part l finishes today so it was quite good that we had that end time that we knew we were going to be like leading everything up to so that really helped with our um plans around that we also knew that we had a lot of content that was funny it was different to what was already out there and that people would enjoy so we didn't want to give too much away that's why we broke it down into episodes and each episode had a teaser and all the character uh, the influencers had their own character videos and stuff just to like build a little bit of um, in, um, engagement around it before we even launch the campaign. So what you can see on your screen now is in the top left corner is our future homes hub which hosts the whole video. Also we looked into things that we knew that our audience didn't know about the regs or things that perhaps they were a little bit confused about. So we put an FAQ that they could perhaps refer back to on a day-to-day -day basis if it was there with like just bite-sized chunks of information that was really quick to read and understand. Um, we also put together an Agony Aunt page. And um, so we made questions around those FAQs and got um, wrote it from the people on our team that are really knowledge about this. We're quite lucky that we have people on our technical team that are part of um, forums that talk around these regs and you know, are instrumental in making sure that they're adopted properly by the people who are on the tools. So um, we've got some names that these people may already know that we can put up there and say that they answer these questions and um, seems to be going down quite well. Also, like I said, the social media channels that we chose, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook and YouTube, we um, developed our TikTok page last year and realized that that was, this sort of content was gonna work really well on that. And it wasn't something that we'd done previously. So making sure that it wasn't only our content that was out there, but the influencers also had their content and it was specific to them. So they weren't just used for the campaign and then ditched. They were also very much instrumental in getting this out there to their audiences and to our audiences also. And um, when you look at the feedback that we got from that and the KPIs that we've got from that, like we've smashed it completely. So we were really, really pleased with how that worked out. But also in, um, I think previously, Polypipe were more focused on the traditional PR route, like making sure that we had articles and features in key trade media. So we didn't want to ignore that because it is still very, very important. and. Although this campaign was focusing on social media, you don't want to ignore the other channels that perhaps people outside of your target audience are still there. You don't want to ignore them. Um, and I think one key statistic from this, um, from the measurement of this campaign that I'm really pleased about is that we've got 100% backlink inclusion, which anyone that works in PR knows that you can write an amazing press release send it all out, make sure that all your links are in there, and then when it appears, there are no links, and it can be heartbreaking sometimes. But having a 100% backlink inclusion is just amazing, because the amount of visits that we've got through to our website in such a small amount of time is, is really brilliant for us, and we're really pleased with that. Um, so the next slide, am I moving on, or are we throwing back? <laughs> Thanks, Maria. Yeah, if you've got anything else to add, please feel free um, or we can move on to measurement in a bit more detail. We're good. I could talk about this all day, this campaign. I love it. <laughs> please do. <laughs> yeah, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they do want to listen to me ramble on all day. <laughs> um, in terms of measurement, you've just touched on it, Maria. Um, I talked at the beginning about setting your KPIs that they're so, so, so important. Um, sometimes you'll end up exceeding some, sometimes you'll end up falling behind on some of them. You know, not everything can possibly go to plan. 
um, you might set something off and, and it just flies, in which case you have to adjust your KPIs. So I think it's about, again, taking a step back and having a look, um, you know, what's going on? I've massively exceeded this KPI. Is that a good thing? Should I keep going there? Or, uh, you know, this KPI is not performing as well. Um, is that absolutely critical to the campaign? Does it matter? Um, and again, you're coming back to your objectives to, to police yourself on that. Um, so KPIs, for example, Maria's just mentioned um, backlinks were really important for your SEO as well as for your direct traffic. Um, but it could be everything from sentiment. Is the audience saying great things about this campaign or do they think it's rubbish? You know, it, this is really, really, really important, especially in a market um, like the heat and plumbing sector. It's absolutely critical that people like you and like your brand and like what you're doing. Um, is engagement key? Do you want to make sure you've got those eyes on the messaging and that people are liking it, they're sharing it. That for us is really, really quite central to everything we do is the engagement level. Um, and it really gives us a good indicator of whether the idea was right, the concept was right, or whether we need to keep tweaking. We will probably as an agency measure most things on a weekly basis. Um, you need to give it a little bit of time. You can't stop panicking after three hours, but at the same time, you know, you need to adjust things if they're not working. So weekly really works for us and we'll go back to our clients and discuss it Re just really honest you know this isn't performing this is what we think we should do about it um, does it matter sometimes the client says no it doesn't matter at all because this is actually excelling in this area so it's about being realistic about your kpis but at the same time using them to police yourself and mm -hmm. um, in terms of measurement you can use loads of different free measuring tools. Google Analytics is probably, we're on that most days, most team members, um, and things like Hootsuite for social media, um, and everything from just setting up Google Alerts right right through to your paid for tools as well. Um, I don't think it matters as long as you've got something that you're happy with that works for you and is giving you the information that you need to make sure you're on track. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's 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 absolutely key is that measurement. Um, that's that's how we prove that we've done a good job for clients. It's how clients kind of prove to the board that campaigns have worked for them. So yeah, I think setting those KPIs from the start is really really crucial. Um, and and the more tangible, the better ultimately. Um, so yeah, I, I just wanted to end by saying I hope that's been a, a just a, a simple short overview on how we go about um, deciding what content's going to work and delivering content that's just a bit different really. Thanks of course to, to Maria and the Polypipe team for trusting us with what's quite a different campaign. Um, it's not every day you say to such a big brand we want to take three uh, heat and plumbing influencers and, and take them to a boxing gym and film them doing challenges um but but the team trusted us with it and it's worked really really well like maria said it's completely smashing its kpis um it's also really helped polypipe build relationships with um installers and particularly the ones that were included in the content um so thanks to the installers for, for being invo involved in that campaign and yeah i hope it's just given you a, a, an overview on how content doesn't need to just be a standard, you know, blog post, press releases, whatever it might be. It very much depends on uh, your audience, your objectives, and yeah, that's how I'd end. Is there anything uh, you'd like to add, Maria or Laura, or shall we move to a and a No, I think you covered it. I think, like you said, like I think something like this will only really work if you trust your agency and know that they know your audience as well, which is why I think this has worked as well as it has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd just like to add to that actually, that we work with a really good video company called Eight Engines. Eight Engines works right across um, every sector going, um, but they actually added a lot of useful um, ideas in. Um, I think the boxing gym, for example, we were looking at different uh, locations and I think they're the ones that actually suggested the boxing gym um, yeah. as a location. So it can be really valuable to take people out of the sector and ask their opinion because you know at the end of the day they're the experts in filming so you know we should listen to them they know what works they see it all day every day um so even if it happens to be your friends your family at weekends things like that you know there's nothing wrong with asking their opinion on something because ultimately they consume news and they're looking at social media all day every day most of them so you know ask their opinions and use them it's i want feel the, the pressure to kind of do it all yourself. Yeah, completely agree. Cool. 
So, Chris, shall we hand back over to you? Yes, um, thank you very much for that. Um, so, I've got a um, couple of questions that have come through. The first of these um, is, what time frame would you set before you expect a return on investment for a, a campaign like this? So, um, uh, I guess, Lucy, you're the best to answer that, aren't you? So, in terms of, I mean, the really good thing about um, social media-led campaigns is that they're, they're very measurable from, from the beginning. Um, you you can you know set your KPIs for it and as soon as you get that first post real video out you can start measuring on um, engagement sentiment on those engagements how many people have uh, watched it obviously with this campaign specifically the fact that we were able to engage um, three key heating installers within the content provided pretty much automatic return on investment for the brand because that's you know three heating installers that we've got in front of we've built up relationships with for polypipe and the brand their relationships that we will keep going throughout the campaign um, but yeah, I'd say actually social media and video led is it, it's very easy to start seeing it kind of quite quickly mm. in terms of KPIs and engagement and things. But I guess it, it depends what sort of uh, return we're talking about. Obviously, it's quite difficult to measure from a sales perspective. And, and we have this quite a lot when we set in um, KPIs in, in PR specifically and content because Obviously, it can drive people to a website, it can drive backlinks, it can visibly um, help your, your, your rankings in Google, it can visibly increase your followers on social, but it is quite difficult to um, attribute that to the bottom line in some cases, yeah. it would be fair to say. Yeah. Um, I think if a PR agency said that they could guarantee that they would add to sales on your bottom line, I think that would probably be a little bit of a fib. Um, but in terms of sentiment, engagement, um, brand reputation, that's something with a campaign like this that can come pretty quickly. But I guess if they're your KPIs, then that is your return on the yeah, investment, yeah. if you will. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think anything online, um, very quick. Anything offline, um, a lot harder to measure, a yeah. lot harder to gauge, um, particularly nowadays. Um, so that, that's obviously going to be a lot slower. Um, I think with the Polypipe campaign as well, knowing that we were going to use the channels that the three influencers have, so they all have their own social media accounts, their own social media for and thousands upon thousands of followers. Um, so again, getting them to post out and then watching those analytics means within you know 48, 72 hours, you're straight away watching what's going on. and it's, It gets a bit addictive after a while. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, certainly after a week or two, you know whether it's working or not, you know whether you're going to get your return and then you know whether to change it up or just keep doing the same. All right, thank you. And of course, you make the point there really that the influencers had a double benefit. One, they were known and therefore when they were prepared to participate and make the uh, video clips, which I've watched, uh, are very good. Um, mm. That in itself made it entertaining, but then you're also drawing in on all their followers, um, which mm. if they're happy with what you've done, um, they're going to share out with them. And, and Maria, perhaps I can ask you, what what made you do something so different in the first place? Was it um, a particular reason on that side? Um, I think like I said before, when we were talking about this and planning it, knowing that Refresh knew our audience and they knew exactly what we were trying to do and having that trust that it wasn't just a weird, crazy idea that they'd come up with, there was actually like method behind their madness, you could say. Um, really helped us go with it and also this is a new working relationship as well we've only just been working with refresh since january of this year and i think um it was just a good way to sort of kick start that and work on something completely different and almost sort of like throw ourselves in the deep end a little bit and see what happens but yeah i think because um party pipe is a brand that's been around for so long and is known for one thing in particular sort of branching out and doing different really made people talk about us and I know from being at trade shows talking to people they've just seen us all over social media which we weren't we were over social media but not in this way before so um yeah just trusting that there was good planning behind this and that it was um one small part of a big campaign was why we went for it as well
Right, thank you. Uh, and of, of course, as you said at the beginning with content, it's about using more than video, but also getting it right. And Laura, um, you talked about your audiences and um, the elements of channel analysis. And I'm presuming that was really important in leading you to make the decision to um, to go this route in terms of uh, engaging with them. Uh, could you just expand a little bit on that, please? Yeah, absolutely. So there'll be about maybe 10, 15 trade magazines in this sector. Um, all of them get sent out to installers every single month, you get the figures. But when you actually talk to the installers, what, what they're consuming is social media. Um, so I guess we are lucky that we would do a lot of work in this sector, but no matter what sector it was, we, we would do that proper audit of the, of the audiences. Um, it, it's absolutely fundamental, because if you get that wrong, you're talking to kind of a room with no people in it. Um, so whereas maybe five, six, seven years ago, we probably would have advised using the trade media for that. We've got a lot more routes, um, a lot more channels at our disposal nowadays. So it really is about picking and choosing the ones that are going to be most effective based on your budget, based on, I don't know, lots of different factors. But social media is, is just the way to go for the, this particular audience. As I say, specifiers will be different um or certainly different social media channels anyway um you know you'd be looking a lot more at linkedin for example if we were talking to specifiers um food and drink sector for example completely different again um so i think you can't underestimate the importance in doing that upfront work you really can't because it underpins everything it's absolutely essential and you get it wrong there's just absolutely no point doing everything else um, so I guess that's why we we hold it quite dear as a process that we have because we wouldn't have our clients if we didn't. So uh, very important. Right, and um, I can see the benefits of using the influencers. Was it difficult, Lucy, to get them to agree to participate in this in the first place? I imagine they might be a bit cautious of your no. motivation. <laughs> Do you know what? It's we knew we would definitely have. A few that was well a lot that would be up for it because we um separately we we own and run um an award scheme called the heating installer awards um very niche but long story short um it's an annual award ceremony that looks to recognize the best heating installers in the uk we've been running that for eight years now um it's very popular in the heating installer community so we've already got a database of thousands of heating installers across the UK and ones that we work with on, on a regular basis so it wasn't a tricky getting people to, to to want to do it it was more making sure that they were aligned with the polypipe brand and had used polypipe products uh, in the past so um knew the brand like the brand like the products because what you don't want is someone that doesn't know the brand that has never known it because essentially that's just you know the they're not brand loyal they'd just be kind of um doing it for the partnership or whatever so it was really important for us to be really selective about the ones we did work with based on um who they were what they stood for um and the relationship with polypipe as well so yeah you'd be surprised but we, we had a, quite a few that were interested the the annoying thing was having to cut the list down um because you know we, we could have done it with 10 but it would have made the um filming job uh, very very difficult um because there's things that you don't even think about when you're filming that we only know through our work with eight engines so you know if, if you've got 10 people we would have needed 10 cameras so that you've got you've always got a camera panning to everyone but then you've got cameras on every individual person in that group as well so that would have made it an absolute mammoth and very very expensive task um so yeah i think we had more installers interested than we could actually get involved so yeah maybe a part two at some point where we can involve some of the others <laughs> right okay because i was just going to ask maria if there was going to be a follow-on to this um like i said this is the start of a bigger campaign so if you sort of put polypipe the products into google this week you'll see that we've been we've done a lot of market research on the back of this as well with refresh and put stuff out about what, more things that we now know about what installers know about part what they don't know what they need help with um so possibly i wouldn't say no just watch this space 
<laughs> okay, fine. So that's not just the installers that got to watch the space, but those who are interested in how it's going to progress. So, <laughs> okay, fine. Well, thank you very much for that. It was very interesting. It sounds like a fun campaign. As I said at the start, we'll be sending through an email to all of those who participated um, with a link not only to download the recording of the webinar, but also um, I'll include a link with that to view the Polypipe um, question of regs um, series of um, videos, which I'm sure you'll find very interesting. So um, with that, I'll say thank you very much to Lucy, Laura and Maria and to yourselves for participating. Um, thank you and goodbye.